Well, good morning, Crossings. It is good to be back. Y'all doing all right? Well, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Luke chapter 14. That's where we're going to be today. And uh, as you get there, I thought, you know what? What better way to get, get our minds off of the cuteness that walked through our, our aisles here a few minutes ago than talking about politics? Not the way you think, though. Not the way you think. Let me take us back uh, to our high school and middle school days, the politics of student body government, okay? So when I was in middle school, this was the first uh, introduction I had into the world of campaigning and, uh, you know, the, the, the flyers on the lockers and the posters. And I'll never forget the campaign promises of the middle school student body candidate. He promised two things. The first thing that he promised was no more homework. <laughs> Bold claim. Bold claim. The second thing that he promised was the vending machines when he was elected would be free. <laughs> and so of course, without a doubt, he won in a landslide. But here's what we realized. This was the first wake-up call to the, the, the world of the political realm is when we went to school the day after he became student body president, we realized that he had not met with the teachers union. <laughs> and he had not seemingly uh, figured out a way to change the philosophy of every teacher in our school because that first day we had homework. <laughs> and then when we went to the lunchroom, all excited to empty that vending machine in seconds, we realized that he had failed to meet with the vendors that own the vending machines. And everything still cost exactly what it cost the day before. And so needless to say, that first day or two of his uh, student body uh, reign, I guess, if you want to call it that, was not pleasant for him. A lot of grumbling, a lot of complaining. And so goes, whether it's from middle school all the way to local and national, like that's just the culture, right? It's, it's our job as the ones listening to the campaign promises to figure out what do they really mean? Like, is that what they, do they really, like, is, do they, can they do that and will they do that? Right? It doesn't stop in middle school. We see this all the time. Like, if you're a fan of the, the musical Hamilton, you saw Aaron Burr give Hamilton the exact same advice. Talk less and smile more. Don't let them know what you're for, right? And so we see this idea that we, we live in a culture, and it's not new to this day, we live in a culture that cultivates skepticism, that cultivates this question of like, are you trying to rip me off? Like, what's happening here? And I think in, in, in no fault of our own, what this, this, um, this kind of this, this culture of skepticism, this culture of, are you trying to rip me off? Because we deal with it day in and day out, not just in the political realm, but in, in advertisements, and we see in the dating scene, like I work with young adults, and this is how they, they describe it, it's kind of like an advertising campaign of like, hey, I'm gonna show you the best and not tell you how many calories are actually in this, right? And they're trying to figure out, like, who is this? And I think... Just because we're human, this skepticism bleeds into our faith. And it's in some way, shape, or form, we end up asking ourselves, Jesus, are you trying to rip me off? Like, I know you say, come and follow me, but what, like, what do you really mean? Is that really what's going, like, what, like can I trust you? And so what we're going to look at today in Luke chapter 14 is this very thing. Because this skepticism, it bleeds into our life. And the short answer is this, is Jesus trying to rip you off? No, he is trying to set you free. But what I love about Jesus, unlike politicians or even companies that we interview with or Instagram profiles that we just can't quite believe are true, Jesus tells us exactly what to expect. He tells us exactly what he's going to do. And this week, we celebrate today Palm Sunday. On Thursday, Monday, Thursday, and then Good Friday, then Resurrection Sunday. And so we're going to see all week through the scriptures that we read, the songs that we sing, we're going to see what it cost Jesus to redeem humanity. And so what I wanted to do this morning was look at the cost for us of following Jesus from the words of Jesus. Like he is about to tell us exactly what it is going to cost us to follow him. 
So if you have your Bibles, Luke 14, verse 25 is where we're going to start. Follow along with me if you have them. Otherwise, they'll be on the screens. It says, large crowds were traveling with Jesus. And turning to them, he said, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their own cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if they lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying the person, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Like, what is Jesus doing here? Like, when I read this, I'm like, wait, Jesus, this is the worst stump speech I have ever heard. Like, this is, like, what are you doing? Right? Like, if you and I were politicians, it'd be as if we gave a speech that said something like this. If you're going to vote for me, you're voting to lose your homes and families. You're asking for higher taxes and lower wages. You're deciding in favor of losing all that you love best. So, come on, vote for me. Like, it's, it's like, when we read these words of Jesus, we have to pause and be like, what, what are you doing? This seems the opposite of what you should be doing. It's the opposite of the way we would do it, right? We would offer no homework and free vending machines because we want a crowd. We, 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 want, we want the crowd. Jesus has the crowd. But suppose we weren't politicians. Suppose we were leaders of a great expedition forging a way through a high and dangerous mountain pass to bring urgent medical aid to villagers cut off from the rest of the world. If we were on an expedition, we would expect difficulty. We would welcome sacrifice to leave things behind that would hinder or obstruct the mission of the expedition. We would gladly leave comfort behind for the sake of others. You see, the mission matters. And Jesus was on a mission to set captives free to seek and save the lost and to redeem all things. And he has invited us into the mission. He has not invited us into comfort. He has not invited us into convenience. And he certainly has not invited us into the American dream. He has invited us on mission. Like to me, it's that, it's that, it's that small switch in our minds of like, I'm, it's not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. And the, and the mission matters. And so it reminds me of this missionary back in the 1800s. His name was David Livingstone. And he was a famous abolitionist pioneer missionary in Africa. And he was a man that was not afraid to deal with hardship or difficulty. And he would, back in obviously the 1800s, there's no email, there's no texting, there's just letter writing. And so the church or the missionary society that had sent him, that had supplied him and financed him to go to Africa had written him a letter. And the letter, the leader sent uh, the message saying this, have you found a good road to where you are? If so, we want to send other men to join you. So this local church is saying, hey, David, we want to supply you with more men to, to accomplish the mission. And so he says, have you found a good road to where you are? And these are the words of David Livingstone. He says this, I, I love this. If you, have, if you have found men who will come only if there is a good road, I don't want them. I want men who will come even if there is no road at all. And just my opinion is I feel like what, what, what David Livingstone is saying here is what Jesus is telling the crowds. Where I am going will be difficult. Where I am going will require more than you want to give. And so just be aware with eyes wide open what it is this invitation is calling us to. Yes, it offers us salvation. Yes, it offers us purpose in life. And yes, it gives us a path to follow. And yes, it's an invitation to be with the Lord like we talked about last week. But there's also a cost to the mission. 
And so we're gonna look at this mission and we're gonna look at this cost. So let's go back to Luke 14, verse 25. Now great crowds accompanied him. You see, Jesus was never short of a crowd. But the reality of it is, is Jesus was not building a ministry of crowds. He was calling disciples. Verse 26, if anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. And so my first point this morning is that following Jesus will cost you relationally. Following Jesus will cost you relationally. Like this is a hard, this is a hard text. And especially this day and age, we hear this word hate and we're like, whoa, easy, Jesus, what are you doing? And so we have to, when we, when we come up against a moment in the scripture where we're not quite sure, like that doesn't sound like Jesus, right? Because the idea of hatred today in 2021 is, is one of a visceral dislike and like opposition. And so when we come across texts, the best thing that I have found to do is, is compare it with other texts and then look at what the hearers of this text would have been hearing in their own language. And so I did that. John chapter 13, we see Jesus in verse 34 and 35 say, love one another as I have loved you. By loving one another the way I have loved you sacrificially, everyone will know you're my disciples. Ephesians 5, Paul instructs husbands, love your wives, and wives respect your husbands. In 1 John 4, 21, John writes, love your brothers and sisters in Christ. Matthew 5, 43, Jesus himself says, Love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. And so all of a sudden we start seeing this, 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 this duplicity, like, all right, well, Jesus, what are you talking about here? Well, the NLT version, I think, gives a really good clarifying statement. It says this, the NLT, New Living Translation, says, a large crowd was following Jesus. He turned around and said to them, if you want to be my disciple, you must, by comparison, hate everyone else. Your father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters. Yes, even your own life. So probably the best way to think about this is in terms of priority and allegiance. Priority and allegiance, that we would make Jesus our priority relationship, that the allegiance of our heart and our mind and our life would be aligned with Jesus. And he's saying, if you cannot do that, if there's any other relationship above our relationship, you cannot be my disciple. I feel like Paul in Colossians chapter one gives us the reason to follow Jesus. Why our allegiance? Because if you're anything like me, like at this point, I'm like, but why? Why should I make Jesus the priority relationship in my life? Why should my allegiance be with Jesus above all? In Colossians one, this is the best explanation of why. Verse 15, Paul writes, the son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together, and he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have supremacy." For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And so what Paul is saying is what we're saying is is what Jesus is saying is he is preeminent. Jesus is supreme. Everything else comes beneath. And so when Jesus says he who is not willing to hate his own mother and father, children, friends, whatever, he's saying is, I am the priority relationship. I am the king ushering in a new kingdom. And so this idea can kind of rub us the wrong way, can it? Like, wait, hold on. But if we're really honest with ourselves, we make allegiances all the time. Like, we make things priority all the time. Let's, let's bring this down to, to our level. So, like, for some of you in, in your work, uh, family life, you, you have to make a decision Is my work going to be the priority or is my family going to be the priority? Because I'm not going to take this job if it requires me to sacrifice my family. You've made a priority decision. For some of you, like even simpler, you might be the saver in your family and your spouse is the spender. And so you need to have a conversation like, what's the priority here? All right? And if we want to get very real here in Oklahoma, let's just open our closets 
Some of you are OSU people and some of you are OU people. You have made your allegiance known, right? Like that is who you are for. And, and, and that team or whatever is above every other team. And Jesus is saying the same thing, but on a cosmic and eternal level. I am the king. To be my disciple, by comparison, you must hate everything else. You see, we're invited not to, co to compromise, but to commitment. And that commitment, Jesus says, will cost. Jesus is not denying the importance of close family or even guaranteeing that relationships will end because of our faith in Jesus. But they might. The question for us is, are we willing to allow our relationship with Jesus to define everything else in our life? He's saying we must be willing and committed to prioritize him over other relationships and even our own lives. Let's continue, verse 27. Jesus says, whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Second point this morning is that following Jesus will cost you, you. It will cost us relationally, and it will cost you, you. It's hard to overstate the shock of Jesus' words would have caused in the heart of those who were listening. Because the cross to the audience that Jesus was speaking to is very different than the way that we see the cross. When we see the cross, when we talk about the cross of Christ, we hear God's love for us. The redemptive work of Jesus on the cross. We're going to celebrate that all week. But to the crowd that Jesus was speaking to, it meant one thing, a one-way trip to death. It was a torture and a death sentence was the cross. And so they would not have heard it through the ears of grace. They would not have heard it through the ears of redemption. They would have heard it through the ears of an invitation to die, a physical death. And so we have to think about that from, from a twofold perspective. One, that's how they would have heard it. And the reality of it is, is almost every single disciple of Jesus died a martyr for their faith. And today in 2021, there are people all around the world that are currently in situations where they are imprisoned and they are being put to death because of their faith in Jesus. Now that is not our situation. Maybe someday we will be put in that situation, but that's not our situation today. And so what do we take from this? And we take the theme of dying to ourselves that we lose the right to ourselves. When we follow Jesus, when we, when we make our allegiance with Jesus, that he is our priority relationship, we lose the right to ourselves. What does that mean? Maybe that means it, we lose the right to watch any form of entertainment that we want. That we wouldn't maybe watch certain shows or movies because of the way we have aligned ourselves. Or maybe it's the way that we spend our money or it's the way that we live our life or it's the way that we speak or the way that we think or the way we treat people that disagree with us. We don't just let our urges and our feelings and our reactions control us. We let Jesus control us. And so we lose the right to ourselves. And we see this theme throughout scripture in Mark chapter eight, verse 34 and 35. Jesus again says, in calling to the crowd, to him with his disciples, he said to them, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. Paul, in Galatians 2.20, says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And then in 1 Corinthians, Paul writes another letter in chapter 6. He says, Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought at a price. So glorify, magnify God with your body. You see, following Jesus will cost you, you. For most, it will not require our physical life, but it might. But it will require a constant willingness to die to yourself, which is both a one-time event and a lifelong daily process. That as we live out our faith, we are constantly asking ourselves, whom am I being um, obedient to? Who am I aligning myself with by saying this, by doing this? 
Each week of this series, we've seen a little bit of a thread of a theme of an invitation. The first week we saw an invitation of, of uh, being set free and, and forgiven. Right? And, then, and then we see a, an invitation to trust the Lord versus trusting our temptation. Then last week we talked about this idea of in, being invited to be with the Lord in prayer. What Jesus is saying here is, I'm inviting you to all of those things, but just come in with eyes wide open, that it will cost you, you. And that to follow Jesus is a constant dying to self and living on mission for which Jesus died. And then let's continue in verse 28. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and consider the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciples. My third point is that following Jesus will cost you ownership. Following Jesus will cost us ownership. I love how Jesus gives these two examples and the idea of both of these examples is the idea of considering. Before we commit, we consider. And we do this all the time. Whether it's a house or a car or you're asking somebody on a date for the first time or you're getting married, like we consider the ramifications, right? Like I'm gonna, guys, let's commiserate together. Like men, like when we ask that girl out for the first time, we are considering at what level we are allowed to put our ego on the line, right? Like she might say no, but we consider it. And when we buy a house or buy a car, we consider, can I afford this? And Jesus is telling these crowds, I know you like the miracles, I know you like your bellies full, but have you considered what it will cost to follow me? Because where we are in Luke, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem, where he would be beaten, and tortured, and crucified. You see, Jesus says, be, you must be willing to give up everything, and to give up something means we no longer own that thing. Right? When, when we give it up, we're giving over the rights. And so we make a switch from being owners to stewards of the things that we have. We go from being in charge to in Christ. Because in Christ, we are stewards, not owners of what God has given us. Whether that's you, your personality, your gift mix, your wiring, the resources he's given you, the, the, the places that he has allowed you to be. Like, no longer are we owners of our things. We are simply stewards of our things. Because we have aligned ourselves and made ourselves allegiance to Jesus. And so that means we steward our money. We steward our emotions and our attitudes. We steward our online presence for the glory of God. We steward our bodies as the temple of the Holy Spirit. Our bodies are not our own. My eyes and my ears and my mouth are not my own. They're surrendered to Christ. And so as we, we engage this world, we engage as stewards of God's resource. We steward our jobs, our relationships, according to kingdom values and kingdom purposes. I worked with a gal one time and we had hired her and, and I was her direct report and one of the things that, that she uh, pr like kind of prided herself in was just quote unquote keeping it real. For most people that means she's rude, <laughs> right? She framed it up differently. I just wanna keep it real. I don't wanna be disingenuous. I don't wanna be inauthentic, right? Those are all good things. Like we don't, we, like we don't want to be inauthentic. But her, but, but her wiring, her personality, did not, it did not cross her mind. Like, but, but maybe the words that come out of my mouth as a Christian matter, how they come out and when they come out of my mouth. 
And so we had to have a real honest conversation that as a Christian, yes, you are wired a certain way and you just like blunt truth, but most people don't hear blunt truth as loving. And so we had to have a real difficult conversation over a period of months about what it actually looks like to speak truth in love. And that is she, what, what, was she kind of bowing down to her own personality or was, she, or was she following Jesus? And so it matters whether we are owners or stewards and as followers of Jesus, it will cost us our ownership status over our life. We give up our life as this week we celebrate Jesus giving up his on our behalf. When we follow Jesus, we become stewards of all that we have, stewarded according to the kingdom of God and his values and his purposes. So this is where we've been. Following Jesus will cost you relationally, it will cost you you, and it will cost you ownership. And that sounds like a lot. <laughs> we'll get to the good news here in just a moment. But as we leave this morning, as we go into this week and we watch Jesus walk his last few days, I wanna give you a couple questions to think about. Number one, have you considered the cost of following Jesus? Have you ever sat down and actually thought, what is it gonna cost me? And before you say, well, I don't know what it's gonna cost me, like, that's okay. We make decisions all the time without knowing everything. But we, maybe a better way to say it, we hedge our bets. We're like, we, we know, like in, in marriage especially, like we know at least some of who we're marrying. Do we know everything? Absolutely not. But we make a commitment knowing that it will require a cost. It will require a commitment of things that I don't know are coming, but I will stay faithful. Have we ever sat down and actually thought like, what is it, what it for me and, and you and your life, what is it gonna cost to follow Jesus? Number two, have you considered the mission of Jesus? Like what, like over the last four weeks, hopefully what we've seen is the mission of Jesus was more than just personal salvation. It was a, said, it was, it was, yes, it was personal salvation, but it was also come with me, follow me, and bring the good news of the kingdom to those around us. And so have we, we considered the mission of Christ in comparison to the mission of our life. Are they one and the same? If you were to watch my life and I were to watch your life, would we say, hey, you look like Jesus. You look like you're on mission with Jesus. You look like, like you're on mission for Jesus. The way that we speak and the way that we act and the way that we react. Number three, what would change or maybe needs to change if you lived as a steward instead of an owner? If you walked out of here today thinking about all the things in your life, your relationships, your jobs, your opportunities, your wiring, your talents, and your gifts, what would change, or maybe what needs to change if you started seeing yourself as a steward of what God has given you instead of an owner? Because here, here, here's, here's the, the, the little switch that we, that we make. Ownership looks like a cruise ship. It looks like I'm, I'm, I want comfort, I want convenience, I want an easy go. Following Jesus looks more like a battleship because we are on a mission. And there is an enemy who would seek to kill and destroy. And so when we start to make that switch of stewardship and ownership, it's moving from a cruise ship mentality of the American dream of that's what we're about to, now we're about Jesus. What was he about? What got him fired up? What did he talk about? What did he pray about? How did he treat people? And so all of a sudden, this ownership versus stewardship becomes a very real thing in our life. Not just something we think about and hear on Sunday and walk out and have lunch and forget. It's a, how, God, how would you have me steward this in my life? And so is there a cost to following Jesus? Yes. Is it worth it? Absolutely. Luke chapter 18, verse 28 and 30. This is what Jesus says. Truly I tell you, no one who has left home 
or wife or brothers or sisters or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will fail to receive many times as much in this age and in the age to come eternal life. Jesus is telling us in Luke 18, it is worth it. Because in the end, the message of the good news of great joy is that we receive infinitely more uh, from God than we can sacrifice for him. All of the comfort, the health, and pleasure of this world pales in comparison to the forgiveness of our sin, the freedom from the power of sin, the love of the Father, adoption into his family, the peace that comes with walking with the Holy Spirit. Oh, and did I mention the eternal life with Christ? You see, Jesus is no politician or salesman. He is the Messiah, our Savior King. Jesus is not trying to rip you off. He wants to set you free from the sin that has caught you by first forgiving you and now sending you as citizens of heaven and the kingdom of God to proclaim freedom for the captives. He doesn't just say, hey, it's just for you. We don't worship God just because of individual salvation. He is doing so much more. And so crossings, I think we have to. We cannot, and I wanna say this because I care for us and I wanna warn us. I want us to help understand. We cannot take the bait of our culture that offers to cheapen or hijack the mission of Jesus. That's what our culture does. That's what our enemy wants to do is take Jesus and attach it to other things that are temporary and in doing so, he perverts the gospel. We cannot exchange the eternal good news for momentary and temporary power, comfort, and convenience. Because the gospel of good news is doing more than we think. It's accomplishing our personal salvation through Jesus. And it's an invitation that God extends to you and to me to be saved from our sin through faith and then be sent empowered to live out the mission of Jesus and the kingdom of God, to bring hope to the hopeless, to bring light to the darkness, to bring order to the chaos. You see, Jesus invites us in. That is the good news. He's like, I am on a mission to seek and save, to set the captives free. I'm on a mission. So let's free the captives, and now you free captives. Let's go free captives. That's our mission, church. As we go into Easter week, that's what Jesus is doing. It's not just so we can have a wonderful church service and feel better about ourselves, although we do. <laughs> the gospel is good news, and I walk out of church every Sunday feeling lighter and more hopeful. But we have been given a call, and this text in Luke 14 is as difficult as it may be to realize that following Jesus will cost us something. It is worth it and he invites us in and along. I'm gonna pray in just a minute, and our prayer teams, if they wanna head on down, we would love to pray with you and for you. If there's something that I can pray for you with, about, man, I would love to do that. I know Blake will be down here, we would love to pray with you. If you've never accepted the invitation of Jesus Christ to be submitted to him and align your life with him, man, we would love to talk with you about that. So, let's pray. Lord, I just want to thank you for this morning. Thank you for your word. And Jesus, thank you for the, the difficult word that you spoke to the crowds. And I would imagine we're a crowd. And so these are words for us to hear. Lord, I pray that you'd bring sight to the blind, those in this room that cannot see the good news of the gospel. Lord, I pray you take the blinders off their eyes, that they would see you, the love that you have for us, the plan that you have put in place to redeem not just us, but all things, and that you have graciously invited us into the process of redemption. God, strengthen us to be agents of your grace to those around us. Strengthen us, God, to go into this world ready to battle to free captives as you have set us free. We pray these things in your name. Amen. Guys, have a great morning.